So this morning when you were doing the, what are the issues? And you were using the phone, reading online what you had. Oh yeah, yeah. I was so triggered. That I was using my phone? Like, I was like, she knows this. Why is this, why is she doing it this way? Why, why is she so, you know, I felt like I was like, <laughs> like, wanting, I wanted it to be fluid. I wanted it to like roll off your tongue. I wanted you to just have mastery of this. And, you know, to be known. And, and, it, and, that, and it was like, I was like riding this, I was standing there going, it was so, I was fucking broncoing me <laughs> to experience it. Like, uh -huh. to be, what, I was like, what? I mean, what? And then I, and then I got into, then I, and then something flipped in me and I, and then I, and then I could love everything you're saying. It was, I got definitely figured by it. Lit. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because this is a signature of disconnection, right? We know this in our society as disconnection. So, it is an interesting thing that this is where I have notes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I understand why there would be that trigger because it looks like some kind of, like I'm disconnecting to go here. Did anyone else get triggered? Uh, I just read the phone? No, just with me reading my notes uh, off my phone. Surprisingly not. <laughs> 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 that is <true>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, which isn't to say that there was a problem with you being triggered at all, at all, at all. But, um, yeah, so, so this is an interesting thing here. And, um, you know, of course I know the content. I invented, invented the content. <laughs> I created the content. What, what I did was structure it in a way that, um, which is, which is, I have a story where I don't love Satsa. I don't mind it, but I don't love it. Part of the reason I don't love it is its lack of organization. And I feel like I want an organized uh, process. So what I do is I come in with organized notes instead of, just, instead of just going wherever it goes so that I can pull it back and, and lead it somewhere. Partly because most of you guys are so advanced and you just have a lot of this down. And so it's sort of like, when I used to sit in satsang, I never, I, hate, I hated it because it wasn't answering my questions. It was answering different questions and I had to just kind of sit and hang out. And I didn't love that. So I kind of feel like I come in with this bias where I just want to like, so I make these notes structured where you guys are at. And then I want to just go through from, from where you are and make sure there's this organized structure. So I thought about it. I thought about taking this and putting it in a book and then just having a book to look at, which would not have been that image. It's totally what you said. It's, I experienced the disconnect. It, that's all that it like, yeah. That so resonates with me. Yeah. That's all that it was. It was yeah. nothing to do with the content. Yeah. I felt you leaving me. And that triggered And me. that's what that was. Yeah. That's great. So good for you for bringing it up. And then in yeah. this moment, just let's just have a real compassionate welcome to how vulnerable it felt to be left, to feel like there was somebody leaving you instead of being with you, especially when I came in and bead with you all. And so that's what that felt like. So we'll just completely welcome that movement. That it's not a problem at all. I'm just, just compassionately love it. That sense of it. And that's just a nice pointer for us all to just really welcome that there's nothing wrong with us. There's no problem with us. And everything is pretty intelligent. And there's intelligent reasons and is voicing this intelligent movement in her that has to do with her system. That it's welcome. That's so nice when it can just evaporate like that. Yeah. 
want to get mad, want to yeah. welcome being seen, allowed. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, if it was a deeper wound, it would stick more. But it's not. So it just has this lovely evaporation when it's finished its wisdom. Yeah. Had just a little bit of peace to say. And then it dissolves. And then the next movement comes. Yeah. And it's excellent, because in there is this little piece, like, have I been left, you know? And then in that very moment, it's like, no. Yeah. We're not, we're not even leaving the movement that's afraid it was left. We won't even abandon that. So that it's welcome to be afraid it's being abandoned as much as it would like. And we'll just welcome it when it arises. Okay, good. So I'm going to recap a few things and just sort of see where we're sitting with it all. So imagine this is my iPad <laughs> or my notebook. <laughs> and okay, so let's go back to our actual practice of delicious yes, because this is a practice we just have to keep practicing. We just practice and practice because so long as we have wounds in our system, which is for a while still, it will always hook us, right? And lead us away. And then we get pinned up against like a should or a fix it or a, you know, or a hideout or a, you know, like, so this will always happen. So let's go through. We go, step one, we notice the fear the fear. Step two, we notice the fear is not true, right? In both of those cases, those are huge practices. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a big practice in between each of those, right? But we have the classes, right? That's what all the classes are for. We keep going through the classes year after year to navigate them. Some of you guys will just be entering the classes, but you know, we've got great practice ground to do one and two. So then number three, come into the body. You guys are all super good at that coming into the body, right? So we've noticed the fear. We've let ourselves see it's not true. We're coming into the body. And this is, again, this is a, when you're up against a rock of despair or just this subtle, like, what's next moment, right? So from that whole spectrum, what's next to, like, I'm going to kill myself, like, anywhere in there, <laughs> is what we need to do, come into the body. From the body is where we start to parade the options. Now, if we haven't a frickin' clue, we're just gonna throw broad things at the wall, right? Which is fine, the broad spectrum, right? So I, what's next? I'm in the body, I haven't a clue, so it's like, just throw something at the wall. Uh, you know, go for a drive, see a movie, and then stay home and crawl into bed and read a book. And that, like, they're just really different, right? Uh, you know, call a friend and go for tea and just throw big strokes at the wall. If we're just really, I cannot find a delicious yes anywhere. From the broad strokes, the, because we're in our body, we can feel the level of effort, right? So it's like, oh, I can't leave, like the, the thought of getting in the car and seeing a movie is effort. So it's like, good, it's not leave the house then. So then the one that feels like crawl into bed and read a book, and then we feel into it, it feels a little dead, feels a little numb, a little disconnected. It's like, okay, okay, it's somewhere in the house, but it's not in bed, you know? Like, okay, so now we have a range, right? So this is from nowhere, just there's not a, because sometimes we get pushed up against this, like, should movement. And then we notice the fear. We believe, the, we recognize the fear is not true. We come into the body, and then it's just like, I don't freaking know. Right. And it's at that point. And sometimes it's literally on the side of the road. Right. Like if you're in the car because you started to go to the birthday party and you just realize it's nothing but pure effort and there's just no way. And so you have to pull the car over right there and just throw broad strokes out to see what's going to happen. Sometimes it's like with kids in tow at the freaking grocery store. Right. And it's like throw the broad strokes out and just feel, you know, feel. Sometimes it's, you know, in the middle of a big family event that's just 
you know, going off the rails and it's painful and you just have to like head for the restroom and you just have to close the door and go through these steps, right? So it's not necessarily, we're not necessarily like in a nice, safe, meditative place, right? We're kind of like hanging out at the edge there, kind of dis- disoriented and knowing that we're in effort um, and we, we've got to get back. So if you already have a sense of what it is, then you can work with the small range, right? So just, um, um, so in the, in the small range, we're going to have things like, I'm hungry, I know I'm hungry, I'm hungry, right? Like that's like, I know. So is it Indian? Is it, I cook what's in the fridge? Is it sushi? You know, like. Is it takeout? Is it what's in the fridge? And where's the delicious from there? Instead of where's the like simplest or the best solution for them or makes everybody, fixes everybody or it's just smoother, right? Or I numb and disconnect and have no needs and just make it happen for the kids or the family or the friends, you know, like instead of any of that, right? It's like, I know I'm hungry. So wait, let's just like come into the body, feel what it is. And then I can work with the small range. Now, this is this stuff you all know. So here's the place where it's a little tricky. Because now, whether it's big range or small range, now there'll be this moment where I know what it is. I know where I'm supposed to go or what I want. But I'm here. <laughs> and that distance can feel very, very far. And this is maybe not true if I'm hungry and the answer was you know, get takeout. But it is very challenging if it's, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, um, what's it called when you purchase a house but you haven't yet? Escrow. I'm in escrow, right? I'm in escrow with somebody on a house and it's just nothing but freaking effort. And my delicious is to rent in another city, right? Like, so, but I'm here, I'm in escrow with someone on a house and delicious over there. So that's a big distance, right? From, so that's the place where it's really a tough thing. So, and let me, let me give you some other examples, of course, or, you know, or the, just the really high stake ones, right? Which is like, it's like my kid. And my kid has this need. And my delicious is not that at all, right? Somewhere else completely. Like, that feels huge as a parent, the distance of that. It's like, you know, and then we're so, we're so stuck there. We're so challenged there. Or it can be a partner, right? Just a, a friend or a deep relationship that, you know, that we're up against those same kind of belief systems. I made this commitment. I said I'm going to be here but it's over here. So in that situation, we can't push, right? We can't effort because effort's not going to get us anywhere. We're working with the effortless. So here we are in escrow, in this thing that we thought was delicious, or we actually won't, in hindsight, we realize it was never delicious. (laughs) And we realized we had a bit of an agenda running and we forgot to really check in. And so now I am here and the whole thing's crashing on me. It's not at all what I want. What I want is over here. So we can't effort to get over there because that's, you know, counterintuitive. So what we have to do is we have to just stop, just stop right there. And sometimes we'll stop for 10 minutes and sometimes we'll stop for two weeks, but we just gotta stop. And then from the stopping, we have to put our focus on that. So that's that place where I talk about just identify the deliciousness. You don't have to do it. Do whatever the heck you want, but just know where it is. Identify it. So if this is identified, here's what's going to work for you. Reality always wins. Whatever's true always trumps the illusion. Always. If you hang on to the relief, Illusion, it can get incredibly painful when truth trumps it. But nevertheless, it trumps it. So if you're sitting in this place, which is an illusionary place, right? It's a lot of effort. And your focus is here on this place. 
Now it's just a matter of time. Frankly, it's really just a matter of time before that reality trumps the fear and it becomes effortless to go here. And that, you just have to wait that out. <laughs> that, and again, it could be 10 minutes. It could be two weeks. But the focus is identification. Identification on delicious yes. Now, in the two weeks, you're going to do nothing. You're not. You're going to maybe, ideally, it might be just terrifying to communicate that you're going to pause the escrow. It might be. And, and it just, just effort everywhere. So you just sort of carry on, right? Carry on in this flow. It's a totally out of alignment flow. You know it, it sucks, you hate it, it's effort. But you may just have to carry on, but the whole time your focus is on what you actually want. And sooner or later, but hopefully sooner, if your focus is really there, not here, but here, this will trump, this will just wait it, and it'll just be easy to get over here. It'll just, clarity will just make, you'll just suddenly, the pathway just gets real, like it just suddenly lights up what to say, how to say, and sometimes you don't have to do one damn thing. Sometimes they just come to you and they say, hey, I don't want this anymore. Another offer came in that was better. Sometimes you have to do nothing. It just, either way, the pathway just opens up. Now, this will not happen if your focus is here. If you have not identified where that delicious is, if you haven't done the work, right? If you haven't recognized the fear, the fear is not true. Come into the body, parade the options, feel what's delicious, land it, identify it. Because otherwise, you guys all know, because we've all lived it so much, right? We're stuck in this stuck place. It's a place of a lot of compromise. It's not working. It's a lot of effort. And then what you do is what I, what all of us do is one of these patterns. We disconnect, we numb out, we just, and we focus on them, right? We focus on what the kid needs or what our partner needs or what our commitment was or what the community is. And at that point, we've completely lost the support of God, right? We've lost the support of our source. That's where we start to decide what we're supposed to do to make it okay for them. And we can't. We can't. We can't fix it for them. We can't save them from being hurt. We can't save someone from being disappointed. We can't save someone from feeling abandoned we can't we can't do anything we can't it's like it turns out we're all one <laughs> everybody's massively autonomous fully autonomous and we can't really affect another not really they can take our words or our actions and stab themselves in the heart with it but we can't really control that so that's a piece of this work of that delicious yes is being able to wait it out keeping your focus here so that being said we can talk practically around some of these big ones that are in your guys's life right now and sort of consider what the identification is because i know you all got a lot um some of the things that we're really up against is our own sense of morality or our communities or our partners or our children's sense of morality. That's the place in that, that place where we're in the escrow, we made the commitment, you know, and it's like versus where the delicious is. A lot of times where it gets hard to like keep your focus on this one, it's because you're up against your own story of morality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And that morality is a story. As wild as that sounds, morality is really a story. Reality doesn't have morality. It doesn't need it. It's just reality. It doesn't need a good, a bad, or an ugly. Life is not doing that, right? In life, it's not actually going, this one's good and this one's bad, right? This oak tree, good, you know, this oak tree, bad. You know, like, it's not doing that, right? It's not going, this oak tree, beautiful, this oak tree, ugly, right? Like, it's not, it doesn't exist because everything is one. Everything is equal. Everything is source, not once ago, but in the moment, in the moment it's arising, it's a projection of this light, this projection of this perfection in that moment. 
So it cannot be good. It cannot be bad. It cannot be ugly. We create this story. And we tell ourselves that this is the story that we need in order for people to get along together, which is another story. Because we're all freaking source. We're all one. We don't need a rule play to get along with each other. You know, it's not like someone's teaching the horses how to be with each other, you know? It's a story, story on story on story. Because we are free. Fundamentally, we are free. We cannot lose our freedom. We are so free. And that freedom can't contain the story of right or wrong. There really is no such thing in reality. Crazy as that sounds. And the, I don't think it's for you guys in your room, but you guys will face that conversation with people in, the, in other rooms that you'll meet that'll say, right, so then serial killers aren't wrong. They can just pick up guns and kill everybody as is, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nice try, loopy spiritual person, or something like that, right? And the true, the true answer is, if where we are, is yes. Because you know why? It happened. Us deciding it was bad or wrong didn't prevent it from happening at all. In fact, may have even done the other thing, may <laughs> have encouraged it. But our opinion about it is happening after the fact. It, you know, our rule play hasn't actually affected the form at all. And if we look to the form very specifically, there's a lot of interesting things that happen if we look very, very directly at the form. So the way this really came home for me, I remember this a lot, because as a woman who was extremely traumatized in her life and, and a victim of sexual crime multiple times over, and all of it traumatized in my system, then I wake up to reality, and it suddenly becomes very clear that we have to accept rape. We have to. And then it seems like it's such a stupid, like, duh, statement, because it's like, because rape exists. Like, we can't pretend to not see rape. Like, we, like our morality is blinding us to what is here. And if we look at what's here, it feels like acceptance is, is allowing it to come forward. But acceptance doesn't do that at all. It helps it to be seen and dissolve, is what happens to it when we actually welcome it and really look at it. So here I am having to really welcome rape with a total welcome, with a like, it's a freaking movement in existence. It just shows up. Here it is. And this like full, like, and I can feel what it, I feel that you can feel what I'm sensing here. Like I feel that, like what that is, like to actually bring this part of ourselves that is so no, right? To war, to rape, to, you know, like no. But to actually do this movement, to actually do that movement, and actually bring it in, to look at it, to really welcome it, to see, because it's freaking, like on one level, because it's freaking here, you know? And our pretending to not see it, by shaming it, by morality, is, is allowing it to breathe. It's giving it the subversive energy. Instead of just bring it up and really look, and really look, but from this full acceptance, non-judgment, no morality, existence is putting it here, so what is this? So what is this movement? And, it's an, and then you discover a lot of amazing things. Now, it was necessary for me to do that. It may not be necessary for you to do that. All I'm suggesting is that when you're up against morality, it's a fear story. And it's not true. So for me, a huge part of my life has been a part of the story of this, this kind of fulfillment, that it's a fulfilling movement for this one to be a teacher, 
they're real. And as a teacher, it's really important that I really understand what rape is because I work with people who have had that experience. And so I need to show them how to unravel it and how to pull all that trauma out of their system. So I got to know exactly what it is. So this is why it was an intelligent movement for me. So this is why in that moment, it arose for me to look at. I'm not suggesting that we all need to start to look at everything that's here. I'm suggesting we need to look at our morality and begin to recognize that it's fear. It's just fear. And it's so entrenched to be necessary. Some kind of necessary movement. Is there a difference between a value and a moral and morality? Is there a can you talk about if there's any difference between morality and value? Yeah, they're, they're really different. So a value is going to be very connected to that delicious yes. It's, it's a unique flavor of ourselves. So it's this thing where it's like, I like pistachio, I hate strawberry. Or I, you know, in a way, which we could almost say that's, you know, a preference or something, but it's a unique aspect of our being. And it changes, it's dynamic, you know, it has a movement to it. So then values would be similarly related, but they tend to have less change. We tend to have always liked truth, even as children. We just wanted what was true, or we just wanted what was compromised, or we were just spiritually bent, even as children, or we were just conscious, we just knew there was something more to reality, even as children. So they're a little more fixed but they're part of that unique flavor of ourselves versus the morality. So the morality is something, it's a, it's a cultural storytelling that we're conditioned inside of that says killing is bad, and if we didn't call it bad, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, the observation is that morality is... Uh, an attempt, it's fear-based because it's an attempt to control outcome, mm -hmm. imagining that if we don't put laws, it's going to happen again. <laughs> yeah, laws but what happens. we see is the opposite is sometimes yeah. true, right. right? Yeah, that if we actually know what it is to die, if we actually know what a kill is, then there might be a lot more consciousness around killing, which might mean there's a lot less killing, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, like... But it's just that, like, if we all knew, um, this is not required because it's not arising authentically for you guys, but if we all really, really knew what rape was, like everybody, like everybody walked, walking on the street, everybody fundamentally, thoroughly knew what rape was, I don't think it would happen so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? If it was just completely, completely out of the freaking closet, very, very clear, everybody knew the roots, everybody knew the source, everybody knew what happens, everybody knows what exists, I, I think we just get a lot more clear, and clarity keeps us safer. Mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting that's what we do, but yeah, the opposite is true, is that we happen to have a kind of an evolution where we're, we believe that morality is important, and we think that that's the reason that there isn't all of the crimes and da 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 da. Except if soon as we take a deep, quick look, we can see that's not the case. If we really take a quick, deep look at the prisons, what we see is a lot of systematic poverty, systematic abuse, systematic, you know, like that's what we see a lot of, right? Even nutritional deficits, <laughs> you know, like we're seeing that, you know, as opposed to like people who generally like to kill people. <laughs> you know, like it's just, we don't tend to see a lot of that. And if we start to look at um, the bigger movements, right? If we look at like the bombing in Orlando or the, the shooting in Orlando, if we look at some of these movements at ISIS and we look at these bigger movements, we see such an intense ball of fear, just an unbelievable amount of fear moving in a way that the fear feels, we all know fear, right? It's incredibly... Um, well, it's hypnotic and incredibly captivating. It has these two signatures. This is really important. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you something that you need to pay attention to. You know, so this is what's the movement in there. Really, really tight. 
and this complete conviction and hypnotic convention that this has to be what is, right? There's very little, we see very little clarity moving in any of these actions at all. And we see that morality isn't a support in these things, for real. I'm resonating with what you're saying, and it's new for me, and it feels radical. I know. And this part, and there's a part of me that goes, wait, wait, what about our whole culture? I mean, I don't really care, but, um, I mean, I, you know what I mean. I but. But um, there's a little bit of an earthquake going on. Just yeah. a little bit. You know, kind of like, and I'm willing to let go of all that. Absolutely. Say that again. I'm so willing to let go of all that. Because it's, because what's earthquaking? I, because um, I see the truth of it. Yeah. And yet I just feel so conditioned. Yeah. But look to and see I, what's shaking, right? Well, I, I'm, I've got like, um, What's shaking? I don't, I've got, I feel like it's all over my body what's shaking. And um, there's like uh, prickles and cold and cold. Yeah. All of a sudden. It's fear. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is, it's fear. Yeah. But I'm so willing. To mm-hmm. let it go. Great. It may not happen this moment. Oh, I want so, it to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it but it feels very radical to me. I don't know about anybody. Because it is it's just it's really so free. Radical. What happens if we live without our morality? Yeah. I just and that, oh, What if all you had was clarity? Well, that'd be so cool. But the yeah. But just look but practically in your life, man. right? Just look practically in your life at like yes. movements with your kids oh, or movements God, with your friends or movements with your community. Everybody, for everybody. But for you Shouldn't personally, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you go without your morality personally in each of those relationships and the yes. only thing that's showing up is clarity then. It's like suddenly there's room for real connection, Mm. even if it's real disconnection, but it's connection. (laughs) And then there's like reality. Reality wins over morality because it's real, it's it's reality. And here's the thing is people have a different, everybody has a different morality, right? Whose morality are you gonna take? ISIS morality? Because that's a morality. That is a very strong morality. Trump's morality, then take Trump's morality, because that's a very specific morality. A Catholic morality, then take that morality. There's a lot of different moralities. Which one are you going to pick? Does the anchor then dissolve? What do you mean? So if you remove the good or the bad judgment to that which has happened to you, and you examine it and you look at it, where does the rage go? Well, then the rage is equally welcome to be here. And the rage is equally met and equally welcomed. And so then it does begin its dissolve, absolutely, because that's all anything, any movement ever wants to be met. It's only here to fulfill itself, right? Everything is just arising as a movement of fulfillment. Once it's seen, once it's met, it's on to the next fulfillment, right? Like it's it, whatever it is, even though our mind might not term it as a fulfillment, it's, it, you know, it's a form that came in. Every piece of those forms have just come to fulfill themselves. And once that's done, it moves. So the rage, of course, is so important because the rage has all that boundary information. So it won't fully dissolve until all those boundaries are really heard. And by really heard, I mean embodied and and lived, you know. Then it it dissolves. But I have this really part of my ass kicking that I've been through this week is that my, my abuser 
has been sitting in a place where we have a kind of a relationship where um, all the rage is dissolved, had dissolved. All the story was completely dissolved. It was just like so, and it wasn't because I had that agenda. I never had that agenda. I was, in fact, I had the opposite agenda. I had, I'm going to kill the fucker, and I'm going to remember this so no one else gets hurt, and I'm going to, like, nourish off of this a lot, and I'm going to, like, identify this is the story of me, you know, was actually how that whole thing moved until awakening happened, and all of this was sitting in so much effort. The effortless had to just come for it, you know, to start to unravel it. It, it just is the natural movement. So... Um, and all this extraordinary movements of forgiveness came up. All this is in the new book. Um, but these movements of forgiveness came up, which, again, I didn't ask for them. I didn't want them. I never sign up for that, like, Forgiveness 101 courses. Not at all. I don't like them. <laughs> and after awakening, I don't like them because love doesn't move like that. We don't get to choose or pick love. And that's what forgiveness is. It's love, right? Love descends upon us if we're lucky. And if we're, a va- yeah, if we're lucky. Even if we're not available, it'll descend on us anyways. <laughs> God damn it. Um, so all these layers and layers of forgiveness came through and came through and came through, and I got to see so clearly these movements with him. I got to see the innocence. I got to see that he and I are one, that this was just this movement fulfilling itself. And frankly, if this movement was going to fulfill itself, it was, he took a worse role. Like That's a harder role to play. It's actually easier to be the victim than the perpetrator. It's easier to be killed than to kill, right? So it's like, oh, actually, he took the hard road. And years and years of different layers of these movements came up, other movements of like, wow, there's such a fulfillment to this one, to do this. Such a fulfillment. It's just so freaking effortless and fantastic. It's just the best. And then part of being at this point required that point. (laughs) <laughs> and then it's sort of like, shit, <laughs> you know, shit, that this piece of fulfillment is so without morality at this level, so doesn't give a shit that it went through all that suffering. Like, like that's not even a story of suffering, like, wow. that even the suffering was like a, was like a, what the hell, we're just playing here in light? Tell this story. Okay, let's tell the story. Like, it's so without a, a, a piece of it at all that there was that layers, right? Where it's like, oh, my God. Because pre-awakening, there was a huge morality that we do not have to suffer like this, you know? Post, it's just like, oh, yeah, right, it's actually okay. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, no. And, like, even that falls off and dissolves. And so layers and layers and layers of forgiveness. So I recently came to this place in the last little while So for about 10 or 15 years, I've been sitting in this place with this man, whereby um, we have this sort of peace, this kind of balance, I thought, where he's still who he is, which is like a more revolting Trump, is, is really what this man is. And nothing has changed there at all. And, but there's this movement around all the bio, biological family, my bio family, that he sort of like comes to like a Christmas event or a Thanksgiving event, and then you just have this like offensive, really, really kind of repulsive human over here, making everybody uncomfortable. And there's this real movement of like, this whole biological family and everybody who's suffered any kind of trauma gets this. It's like you get traumatized and everyone else pretends it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, and that, that movement is a violation to the fact that it happened. And, but we've all played both roles. We have been witness to people who have been traumatized and we've downplayed it and pretend it didn't happen for them either, right? Like this is, this is because we're not practiced at just welcoming and letting it be here. So then, um, so then there's this movement where the bio family is pretending none of this happened, and then here's this horrible person who actually is responsible for it. And then to make matters worse is he sometimes talks about it, but in this really horrible way. Like, you're just mad because I was a strict... Like, which is just like... 
crazy like to not pick up a fork and just stick it through his eyes right like it's just like and then you're just mad at me because I used my fork wrong you know like <laughs> right <laughs> so so there's this move so what was happening was this compromise of the way I love this human because I actually really love this man I can't change the fact that that's the case. But I don't like this man, <laughs> even a little bit. And it also makes the people who love me uncomfortable that they have to be around this man, because they also would like some explanations around it. There's a stick, you know, like, so the whole thing is a little out of balance, right? It's in this kind of compromised place to kind of speak to the love in a way. So um, recently, it just brew up, brewed up to like put it in right alignment. Uh, and right alignment is just like never again in this lifetime or any lifetime see you again. But like, like, no, it's like the death, like the, the, the death, the death, death. And in order for that death to arise, it really had to like come in like a motherfucker, you know, like it had to basically what it looked like was like a week and a half of just incredible harassment from him you know through my emails and my phone like every line of communication just like massive harassment coming at me so for it to just be like no you know like no for all time and I realized I wasn't ready for him to die and and I've had to mourn the death of this man ironically fucking hell <laughs> and so I've had to go through the heartbreak of the death is what I've had to go through. And it's been very curious through the whole thing. So to get back to the piece of like, if we really look at what's going on, does it make the rage dissolve? It makes it dissolve, yeah. But at the same time, it's still, if we're willing to, put, if we're willing to be in clarity, it's going to put it into clarity. And we may not want shit to go there, but it's going to go there. Anyway, and some of that might look like really challenging things for us. So it's, there's not a simple answer to, but there's a bigger answer that says everything that's happening for all of us has such an intelligent movement. It's just got this incredible right action to it. And sometimes we can't harvest that for a number of years. Or sometimes, but, we, but often we can sense it. We can sense the intelligence. We can sense that there'll be a harvest at some point. Which is um, a, a kind of an interesting thing about life. So should we talk about some of the stuff that goes on in your, your lives? What's the time? Yeah, we've got, we've got a good chunk of time here in front of us. We don't have to. Um, maybe riffing off of what we were just talking about. Yeah. I'm being a little bit of a broken record. We talked about this in our last session. Okay. I'm obsessed with the election and with the state of the country, it just terrified that we're headed for civil war and just you know seeing the people with the Trump signs in my neighborhood and seeing um, people put their carry on with the AK-47 sticker on their cars right after the Newtown massacre several years ago in Connecticut. I'm just like watching the <laughs> just... Good, okay. So the first thing we want to do is we really want to bring it in, right? We got to welcome it all in. We got to pull off the morality story. And we have to bring the whole movement in to really look at what that is, right? Why are these people so passionate about this man and wanting him to be the leader? What's going on for them? What's happening? If we're all one and we're all equal, 
we're not better than them. And then, then what's going on? So what do you think? Well, I was thinking about this, and it's like, and, you know, I feel like at the end of the line for all of us, we just want to feel safe. You know, I feel like there's a big fear movement around, you know, they want to feel safe. And you feel like this person's going to deliver safe, you know? Great. And then that's as far as I got. Okay. This is good. This is good. Well, we've all been kind of looking at this. So what else do we see? People want a change. They want a change. Yeah. But they're voting they're 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 here for change? Yes. Yeah. yeah what do they want change from? The, the structures. They, they, want, they, want, they want people to have jobs. They want the economies to be restored. Yeah, so, so specifically we can say the American people, there's a bunch of people who have a definition of what American is, unique from any other person in the world. And the uniqueness of it is that, this is, this is a thing, right? That, that the unique, in every country has, Australians have it, that they're unique from everybody else or Canadians have, right? So the American piece that's different from everybody else is that <clears throat> there's a capitalist economy, which is a free market economy, which is an equalizer. So the story goes, if you work hard and you be strategic and smart, then anyone can make something of themselves. And they can, then you pay for your things. You pay for your education. You pay for your health care, right? Because you earn it. And you earn it in a specific way. And it's this level of, like, it just makes. But if I work very hard and do this, and I have to pay for their education, then I'm feeling like my freedom is. Not very free. And I don't even like the way they choose to be educated. And I'm the one paying for it, is the feeling, right? So there's a movement that says, I want to not pay for education. I don't want to pay for health care. And I don't want to, I don't want to pay the bill of America's services. I want to work and pay the bill of my family and then let my family choose whatever they want. So there's a, so that chain they want that change, and they and they're passionate about that change. However, we're seeing that the stats is that in terms of environmental illness, the world is actually much better than one thought it was going to be. Certainly, the predictions of of gore and all of that 11th hour, it's way more better, but way better than we thought. In terms of global economics, although there's been some incredible hits, it's actually considerably better than it was even seven years ago. We can see that on the human, um, like, murders, deaths, human trafficking, that kind of stuff, is like so much better than it ever has been. Sort of the 80s being the worst, but kind of a resurrection in the 90s, but it's just considerably better. We're seeing, so we're seeing just basically globally a much less shadowed space. So possibly bringing the shadow forward is helping us to bring in some real clarity to, to some situations. And people are playing that role. So what if we saw that that sticker, that Trump sticker as this like you know, there's myself over there wanting safety, afraid and needing to play that part, which is a harder part to play in a way, maybe. Um then my part. And this sort of movement that goes, okay, I have to play my part, which is a, an interesting thing, right? Because it's like, people are really struggling. And so, uh, what is the relationship then 
between the fear and the rage. That's where I was going because that's rage. Yeah. How, how, how do you see that playing out? Well, let's look at that together because we can see that rage is boundaries, right? It's anger. It's boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's wanting to set some boundaries. And so there's the wanting to set boundaries around, you know, my money, my income, my energy, my work. Um, there's wanting to set boundaries around, you know, in America, it's like my home is my private space that government can't come into. And they're wanting to protect that boundary, which can also include property boundaries. And, you know, like just like that, that, that I can, I get to do whatever I want in this space. And then. So then the, the right to bear arms also kind of connects yeah. to fear and to rage. Yeah, so we're, auto -determination, so yeah determination. I absolutely want to have the right to protect my home or my property in any way I see fit. Um, I think that this might tie into what made Alice start to shake when we started to talk about morality, um, because it's clear that morality can't be legislated. And we think morality can be legislated, mm -hmm. the thou shalt nots. So we can make laws around them. And I think that what's happening maybe collectively, it's not even just the American dream, it's this dream or this belief that this type of a go that any other outside government can support us or control us or make things better for us. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, to use your word, we're going through a serious upgrade mm -hmm. of um, th th this is the government right mm -hmm. here. And the only time you're ever really self-governed is when you're governed by God. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to think that a government can give you your education or your health or your, it's a system that's just never worked mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think we're all feeling that earthquake under our feet um, start to crumble. And we have a group like this that's getting this serious upgrade in what, self-government really is mm -hmm. and this source of abundance and source of health and source of um, mm -hmm. and when you have a dream you know something that you've placed your whole life you based you know your whole life on I want to and, and, and then you realize it didn't work um, you're gonna go to rage mm -hmm. you know and then Hopefully you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and you realize you pick out what was good and what was strong and what got you where you are and and you don't crumble over it. It, it just ends up making you, making you stronger. In a country like America, we're going to have to educate ourselves on how to live with diversity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it doesn't collaborate in the way another country would. Like, for instance, you know, most of the other first world countries have a socialist government, a very different government, which means those people have an agreement over what our role of government is. And our role of government is to pay for schools, is to pay for health care, and for education. That These are the and top values. And an infrastructure, right? Yeah, so there's yeah. this story about this, this, this is the value, and this is, and then we, and then we, we pay for that, and we get that. Whether, however happy we are with the service or not, but there's that communal. And America has a very different structure it doesn't have that right it has this capitalist free economy and in that space we have got to embrace diversity right we have to recognize that in that kind of an economy somebody feels incredibly passionate that a, that a baby's life begins at conception and that that's a person there and that it's not you're not allowed to kill a person is perhaps a, a, their belief system yeah. and then how do we have that beside someone who says, no, I mean, a, a woman has a right. A woman has a right. She gets the right to choose. And, you know, so what we have is diversity, right? So we have to figure out how to navigate diversity, which part of it is that we're going to have to recognize if someone doesn't have our values, they are not less than us, mm -hmm. right? That they are just a different value. They are not less educated, less smart, less the one, less, you know. They just have a very different value. And that our values don't agree.
But by having all of these diverse values, we have a much more thorough conversation, right? We have an actual conversation. We have an actual dialogue because we have these different viewpoints. So it goes back to the conversation in a way that's like, how do we connect when people have different values and we love them, right? Part of the way we can connect is recognizing there's just, there's one. And that someone who is supporting, let's say in this example, someone who's supporting Trump isn't threatening our humanity or our safety. They're wanting to, they have a very passionate expression. And they want the right to passionately express. And if we can allow and have space for that conversation, they're going to A, start to feel safer, right? And B start to feel like they're welcome and they belong and start to be heard. What happens when something gets really met, gets seen and heard and welcomed? It dissolves. It moves, right? So it gets stuck in that place where we're afraid and we tap the morality sticker on it and then we like pull back instead of recognizing that. And America is a very diverse place. I mean, we don't really have to search very far for this extraordinary diversity of so much culture and so much, you know, viewpoint. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a country built on immigrants, you know, that has such great, incredible, diverse experience. And it's global immigration, right? It's not European immigration, right? It's this global immigration. So it's this place that America has, has sat in a less than perfect space with around diversity. And so it's possible that all of this is the beginning of us learning how to navigate diversity, to let it be. So Karen, <clears throat> is, is the lesson for us as individuals here, you know, where we are right now, taking in these moralities, whether it's the election or whatever, and facing them as if they were our own issues and facing the fear and eventually getting to the point of dissolving that, that makes us an upgrade and helps us to be more effective to, you know, to either um, for ourselves to live more sanely in this, in this chaos or, you know, to help, our, help others to move, to make that movement forward. I mean, it, it seems it's like to be me, unique. bring it back to an individual basis. I mean, we're all worried about what everybody else is doing, but... Yeah, but well, so we can see it's up for a few things, right? We can see that there's a little bit of wounding around this past event in Connecticut. So it's triggering some of that. We can see that is beautifully navigating her own relationship with fear. And so this whole aspect of the elections... <laughs> is a nice trigger point of like, are you sure you want to leave fear behind? <laughs> are you sure you don't want to just kind of juice off of it for longer? <laughs> this is really important. I'm telling you something that you really need to pay attention to. <laughs> you do have to pay attention to this, right? So, so it's navigating her own relationship with all of that, right? So it's really alive and up for her. Over here, I could give a flying fuck. I have not paid attention one yeah. iota. It's not at all up for me. So I don't have a personal relationship to this election at all. I had a brief personal relationship to this election, but um, it dissolved when it needed to dissolve, and it was like I haven't paid attention at all. I, I, I think that's where I've come to, and it, you know, is is. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of gotten to the point where it's dissolved for me, too. It's like I don't, I don't want to fight the game. I don't want, the fear is not yeah. there anymore because I know that we're going to be okay regardless of who gets elected. I think that's the story. I think that's what Brexit set forward for us all. I mean, that's like nuclear implosion on the political scene. And they're doing really fine. <laughs> we projected this big bump. And it was like the biggest bump was like a week after Brexit. You know, like that's it. So there's this, I think, and we're also seeing that in Denmark also, that we're getting this messaging that it's like, as a global society, we are actually not so country-based. 
and that the impact of the global movements have bigger impacts on our economics, our health care, our well-being than these than country country politics or yeah, I was going to say something along those lines yeah. because uh, we are such a small country, right? My country is 15, 14 times in the state of Texas, right? So, um, but we, geopolitically, the United States is so important in a way, you know? It's always been like, uh, we always knew our place in the world in relationship to the big brother, which was North America, right? Mm -hmm. Initially, Canada, Mexico. So everybody prays. My mother goes to mass praying for the election, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> in Latin America, everybody's concerned, yeah. right? I mean, everybody's concerned. And um, so what I'm trying to say is that, you in know, China, we wanted to move way, to yeah. Iceland, or my girlfriend in North Carolina said, I'm going down to Costa Rica after, you know, this election. It's like, that's not the point, because <laughs> unfortunately, what happens here affects so much of everybody. Yeah, maybe yeah. because because I used to live here. This yeah. is my second home, and I have a dual citizenship. So yeah, I, I could vote, but I I I already let it go. I don't want. I I didn't even register to vote on this election. So, it, we are so interconnected, and I didn't know that when I lived here half of well, my life, almost you know, many years. When I went down, and then it's back again. It's it's so interconnected. What happens to the dollar affects everybody. But what happens to the dollar? Is affected by what happens with the euro, and of what course. happens with the euro is affected by what happens with the yen. Yes, and what happens course. with the yen is affects with the dollar. So in fact, the it, dollar is not the leader. No, gold's not even the leader. No, no, right? no. What, like, what I tried to say is we're connected. It's it's so it goes, connected, it's so and that's connected. what we saw, right? So so Brexit happened. Three trillion dollars was wiped off the global stock exchange, right? So that's a very direct. That's like entire villages in China have no income and will starve, right? Like that's the direct input of that. So this happens within the week, right? One of the biggest, you know, and, and sort of most charismatic, so most outspoken is Richard Branson, who has, you know, who personally was projecting to lose a third of his wealth, which is a huge part of British, the British, you know, gross national product is mm -hmm. his, all of his companies. He managed instead to just shift it around. <laughs> it just got a reorganization is what it did. And so it didn't take one third of his company. It didn't even take an eighth. It took this like little tiny piece that he restructured and rebranded. And what we're even seeing is that however many months later we are, we're not even like six months out of that. Like it's not far, but you know, it, it was actually a really good reorganization of his brands and companies, and they're expecting a huge return, right? So there's like, at this point, when we're looking at these levels where it's just so interconnected, um, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's, you know, you'd have to have a PhD in economics to even project, but then we're seeing that those projections are totally off. And so it's like, it's like there's a, there's an interconnectedness that, that's at play, and that interconnectedness is not really needing, isn't so deeply affected by one piece of it as much as we're projecting it might be. And that's kind of what we've been seeing from England, but, but who knows, you know, like, so we're in that place. But I, I think that the, the bigger story is that... Um, is this a big play on your psyche, right? Like, is this actually alive in your world in a real way, right? Is it just an irritating fly? In that which case, it's not really up for you, right? Is it this, like, major impact that you're just completely consumed in? And it's up for you. And then we get to look at, like, what's really going on, right? So the first thing we have to do is really bring, so this is the story, right? Like, whatever's up in our lives, it's there for an intelligent reason. It's necessary. So we just really have to bring it up and we have to really look at it, which means we have to really accept it. We have to pull away our morality story of, of our whatever we are, right? The fear that you're feeling. We need to welcome it. We need to let it be here. We need to see what's really going on. We need to welcome what's being touched and the wounds and where it's being hit and what it's, you know, and it's like fear of safety, right? This is a big one that you've been trying to figure out how to let go of in the first place, right? So 
here we are, right? Ver and then part of that might be bringing in all of these other aspects and, and seeing them and welcoming them and letting them be here, letting them be seen, letting them be moved, because the truth is, it's all just light being projected in a moment. It's a mirror. It's not really there. And so what's our relationship with the mirror? And what's it pushing on, right? The mirror is going to mirror things that are going to push on our stuff so that we can up-level our stuff, so we can start to move through our stuff. In the house of relationship, I had this little jagged corner, and this needed, this triggered it and hit it so that I had to start working it and starting to move it. And that's just going to create all kinds, and it already has, created all, all kinds of ripples and all kinds of other relationships in my life. To just like, even in subtle ones, I was talking about like, just like, you know, just the, the person who does my landscaping or something, you know, it's like it was the wrong person. I had to get someone else wrong, like this didn't work, you know, like little subtle relationships all over the place that were just like needing cleaning up and needing to reorganize. And uh, because this, this chunk was unhealed in the mirror, I had these what looked like really great relationships, but if you look closer, some of them were a bit jagged. And then what happened is one of them exploded and pushed on this jagged piece. And so as I started to unravel this jagged, these jagged pieces dissolved so that better pieces could come in, which is the up-level process. Yeah, and there's no end to that. Look, I was going to say, is it's there an, an eternal end? movement. It's is there an end? You I'm can't believe say that. It's never an end. It's never an end. Yeah. Never the great news is, is that you get to coast in large periods of time when there's very little to no wounding. Large period of times with just like rest huge movements sometimes. of fulfillment. Yes. Do, do I get to rest? You get, sometimes. well, probably not for a little while. Because <laughs> there's still so much wounding. <laughs> Later tonight in stillness, yeah. in meditation. Yeah, um, yeah there, there are places that we can... You do, know, you, just, do you have... Do you have to, sorry, I'm thinking in Spanish. Um, do you always have to come inside to get to stillness like we do? We are basically in, in kindergarten. I am in kindergarten. but <laughs> Or you can just twinkle, twinkle, and you're there. For me, I'm always there. You're always there. So let's say in my teachings, the way I work, right, is I'm different from most non-dual teachers where I just go for the wound, where the wounds are. So all the work and all the tools and all the practices are like, where's the wound and how do we unravel those wounds? And so in the core of my teaching, which is the classes, so we've got these three classes, the body class where we do the first excavation and pulling up the wounds, right? And then we go into accelerated healing, which is we go step by step by step on what it is to unravel the moon from beginning to end. Then we do the course in fearless, which is how do you navigate real reality? What happens, right? But the first year you take those, you just get fucking blown out of the water, right? Because it's just like boom, 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 right? So then you got to come back and take them again. <laughs> so that you come back and take them again and things sit a little deeper in. And then if people don't have very many pain bodies, just two rounds through, and you're no longer moving from fear. You're not making choices from fear at all. You're, and you're really navigating what happens. So at that point, you can enter master class. And in the master class piece, we're really seeing it's just kind of like up against reality. It's just like, it's just like how is reality going, you know? And what we saw in the first master class is that it was like six weeks into master class has a big awakening and then it has a pretty solid kind of opening because it's just like you just run into reality right because if there's nothing in the way yes you're just up against you're reality you're shielding yeah sort of. and if you're sitting in a community of people where people are some some people are living very deep in that reality and some people are navigating it it, it has an influential factor of just like oh when someone's going i see this and then there's nothing in the way for you to see that too and you look there it starts to have this movement, but everybody has their own unique journey. And it's not, I don't think it is more valuable to be awake than not awake. I don't think that that's true even a little bit. And I think that coming face to face with reality is a great thing. Um, 
And it's naturally going to happen when you have very few wounds. It sometimes happens when you have a lot of wounds also, right? Which is me, right? So it's not a, we can't say one way or the other, like we can't create a recipe for it. But we can say that whether or not you're awake or not, it's quite easy to come to stillness, I'm, I would say. And it doesn't require this deep look inside because you're not carving away all the wounded places, right, to get to the stillness. It's like if there's no wounded places, there's a lot of stillness. Also, in each step of the journey for each of us, it's always about fulfillment, like everything. So there's not a place that you're going to get to and it's like, this is fulfilling. It's like, if we're following that delicious yes, we're walking fulfillment all the time. And so, in which case, it's like, who cares where you're going? (laughs) Ultimately, it's like, what's this moment like? Is this moment having its fulfillment, you know? And... And that's kind of a cool thing.